I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock that the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock that the God of my salvation be exalted. Let us pray. Our most glorious Heavenly Father, we come before your throne this morning, praising your high and holy name, for thou art God. There is no other. There has never been another and can never be another. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all the blessings you send our way. We thank you for the church, the greatest place that man can be since your son has returned to you. For when we gather together and form the church, we are amongst you and with you, and we have fellowship one with another. We thank you to Heavenly Father for this group of Christians and all the Christians everywhere. We ask your blessings upon this church and all the others. We ask dear Heavenly Father that you be with us and help us as we seek to increase your number here and as we cease to serve you in all things. Forgive us of our sins. Use us always in your service. In Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen. Before we take communion together this morning, we'll sing the first four verses and then the chorus of 2,000 Angels. 
They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, peace to blame. church. Last week we talked about remembrance, talked about our abundance has caused us to forget God, to forget what God has done for us, and to forget why we gather around this table. We talked about remembering what it is that Christ has done for us and, and what it means to gather around this table. Today we're going to talk about forgiveness. And as I look at the word forgiveness and what it means, no greater example of forgiveness is found than what I find in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Luke 23, 34, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. As you look at the word forgiveness, what does it mean to you? Have you ever been hurt? Have you ever had words thrown at you so sharply, so, so un, uncaringly? Words that were meant to hurt, words that were meant to wound. And every one of us have been hurt by other individuals and, and things that people have said to us and done to us. And as we read about the crucifixion, we read that as they passed by the cross, they hurled insults at Jesus. Words that were meant to hurt. And yet he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I've been doing a uh, 
many devotional, daily devotional on forgiveness. And I, I found some interesting facets of that, that that have really stuck with me. And the first thing is forgiveness is possible, but will not always feel probable. There are times when we're hurt that we wonder how can we possibly forgive, but we can. But often in our hearts it doesn't feel like we can. And forgiveness is a two-edged sword, a two-edged word. It's hard to give, yet it's amazing to get. And forgiveness doesn't rise and fall on my merits. It doesn't depend on my strength. It doesn't depend on how mature I think I am. Yet forgiveness lies solely with God's help. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 We read, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And as I read that verse, I did a lot of comparisons and the amplified version uses that word tenderhearted said compassionate and understanding. But when it said forgiving one another, it translated that as freely and readily. You see on the cross, Christ was freely and readily ready to offer the forgiveness that we needed. God knew that I can't do it alone. God knew that I needed help to offer forgiveness to others. You see, forgiveness is not an act of my determination, but it's an act of my cooperation with what God has done for me through Jesus on the cross. God offered a forgiving way to give and receive this forgiveness. And it's this forgiveness that we meditate on today as we gather around this table. We do remember what Christ has done for us. And we do remember how much we have been forgiven. Let us imitate Christ in forgiving one another. Would you bow please? Our God and our Father in heaven, as we gather around this table, our minds return to the cross. The cruelty and the agony that our Savior suffered beyond our comprehension and understanding at times. And yet, our Savior said, Father, forgive them. As his blood flowed down from the wounds that were inflicted upon him, he said, Father, forgive them. And so today, Father, as we take of this bread, we remember the forgiveness that's been extended to us. Help us, Father, to take of this in a manner that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Once again, let us bow. Father, again, we approach your throne in prayer. Thanking you for the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, the blood that would, (coughs) the blood that would cleanse us from our sins. The blood that was offered so freely by the one who was without sin. And Father, as we take of this cup, help us to remember that. And help us, Father, to take of this cup in a way that does please you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would like to remind you, separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, that uh, there are buckets at the uh, end of the pews for you to place your contribution. Uh, Don't be like me and forget and leave it in your pocket. But uh, being we don't pass the the baskets around anymore, that's hard to remember some days, but uh, be sure and leave your contribution. Scripture reading this morning will be taken from Revelations, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings of pearls and thunder before the th- throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, there was as it were, I'm sorry, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion and the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings and full of eyes and, and all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for the created, uh, for you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Before Jack speaks to us, we'll sing Soldiers of Christ Arise. And if you will, please arise. Soldiers of Christ Arise and put your armor on. Strong in the street which God supplies. Strong in the street which God supplies through His beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in His mighty power. Thank you. 
Good morning. We are glad you are here, especially those of you who are guests. Uh, delighted that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. And as we always say, if you're looking for a church home, welcome home. Don't look any further. We'd love to have you as a part of the family here at Rossville. Open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read the first eight verses of that in just a few moments. And as you're turning, I want to tell you about a story that I heard the other day. There was this burglar that uh, broke into the house, that's what burglars do, broke into the house and is about to lay his hands on this big, huge, flat screen TV, or it'd be a curved screen now, I guess. He's getting ready to grab that TV, and a voice in the room says, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Jesus is watching. Kind of shook him up a little bit, because he thought he was the only one in the house. And so he starts looking around the room, and and he sees this parrot perched in his cage. And he says, was that you? He said, yeah, I was just warning you. Jesus is watching. This guy kind of laughed to himself and couldn't believe he was frightened over a parrot. And he said, who do you think you are? He said, I'm Moses. And Jesus is watching you. What kind of people would name a parrot Moses? He said the same kind of people that would name a pet bull Jesus. <laughs> Some of y'all get that tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> you see, what we say is determined by who we say it to. I don't know what you say to a talking parrot, but what we say is determined by who we say it to. Got a little video, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to get choked up up here. Got a little video that I want you to watch here that reinforces that thought. Have to listen real carefully, it doesn't last long. Terry, go ahead. David has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How, how, much, money, how much money does he have? Jay and broke. Little boy is doing his homework with his dad. He's got a math problem he's doing. And if you didn't hear all that, the quality of the sound is not that good. The math problem is simply this. Jaden's got a dollar, a quarter, and two pennies. How much money does Jaden have? And little boy immediately responds, Jaden broke. I mean, I get that. I just, that's hilarious. I bet I laughed for 30 minutes the first time I saw that. And what that says is, this little boy feels really comfortable around his father. And I'm sure dad is the kind of guy that's making jokes all the time too. But you know what you would hope is this little boy doesn't go to school and do the same thing. Because he's probably going to be in trouble if he tries that at school. What we say is determined by who we say it to. I want you to imagine for just a moment that the Queen of England decided to make a visit to Rossville, Georgia. She wants to see the duck pond. The Queen of England comes to Rossville, Georgia, and you get an opportunity to talk to her. You get an opportunity to go up to her and say whatever you want to say. I don't think it would be proper or appropriate. I don't think you would say, I don't think any of us would say, hey, Liz, what's up? Would we? Don't think we would. You see, because we know that what we say is determined by who we say it to. We're going to look at this passage in Isaiah. It's going to help us know what we should say to a king. Not just a king, but the king. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, 
And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. You know, here is Isaiah. Isaiah who finds himself in the very throne room of God, the King of Kings. David read for us from Revelation chapter 4 a, a picture, a word picture, helping us to see inside that throne room. Symbolic language, but to help us realize that this is the King of Kings. This is the Creator of of everything. He's the Lord of hosts. Everything that is, He created. He is the King. And this place is shaking. And I would have to believe that, oh, Isaiah, as he's there in the presence of God, is himself shaken. Being in the presence of God shakes us. But being in the presence of God also serves to shape us as well. You know, when we read this story here in Isaiah, when we read Revelation chapter 4, I'm reminded of Moses in Exodus chapter 3, as he is there at that burning bush, as he is in the very presence of God. You remember what God told him? Take off your shoes, because you are on holy ground. You're in the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 19, the people of Israel are encamped at Mount Sinai, and the presence of God comes on that mountain, and there is that lightning, there is that thunder, same imagery that David read for us in Revelation chapter 4, and, 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 and the mountain sh literally shook, and the lives of the Israelites were changed forever. Acts chapter 4. Verse 31, the church has begun in Acts chapter 2. The apostles are preaching the word. People are being, being saved every single day. Peter and James are arrested. They're taken to jail. They release from jail. They get out. Verse number 31 of Acts chapter 4, we find the people of God there, the Christians, these first Christians. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. These people were in the very presence of God in this house. And it was shaken and they were shaken and their lives were shaped. You see, what we're reading about when we read of these throne room scenes, when we read about these scenes in which we find people in the presence of God, we're looking at scenes that bring to us the reality of the presence of God. What it does, these scenes take us from God who is a concept and turn him into something that is real. You know, it doesn't matter if it's Isaiah. It doesn't matter if it's Moses or the Israelites or the apostles or even us. If God is a concept, if he's only a concept, we shape him. That is, we make God who we want him to be. But when God becomes a reality, he shapes us. Okay, concept, reality. Let me... Let me just be real candid and blunt with you what being God being a concept looks, at, looks like. When God is only a concept, God, I know you don't want me to sleep with my girlfriend or my boyfriend, but I'm going to do it anyway. See, if God is, is only a concept, when God says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. Well, but see, I've got this game. I've got a golf game I've got. I mean, it's been on the docket for a long time. Or I've got this ball game that I got to go to. 
That's God as a concept rather than God being a reality. Is God a concept or reality in our lives? That's the question I want us to think about long and hard this morning. See, if, if God is only a concept, he's diet God. He's God light. That is, we don't have everything that makes up God. It, that we've substituted some things in there. And when that's the case, the transformational part of God is done away with. We've done away with that. God doesn't change us. But when we come into the presence of God as a reality, when we come into the presence of God knowing that He is King of kings and Lord of lords, that He is the ruler of the universe, He is the one who created billions upon billions and billions of stars and knows the name of every single one of them and knows the location of every single one of them. See, the reality of God is quite different. There's a great difference between that and just having a concept of God. You see, God is not my personal assistant that I can call on to, to aid me along in my everyday life. God is not my buddy. Now, I'm his child, he's my father, but he's not my buddy. God is not my lucky rabbit's foot that I pull out when I'm in trouble. Get me through this, God. Again, he's the king of kings, the Lord of hosts. And when Isaiah interfaces with him here, what do you say? What do you say to God? Well, my advice would be we take a play out of a page out of Isaiah's playbook. What do you say in the presence of God? You say nothing. You say nothing. Because to say nothing is to invite God to speak to us. And how does God speak to us? He speaks to us through His Word. James, I think, put it like this. Swift to hear and slow to speak. And then James goes on to say, two verses down from that, James 1 verse 21, he says, Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. No, no, wait a minute. James, you're writing to Christians here. You're writing to brothers as he introduces the letter. And you're, wait, and you're saying to save them? Yeah. Yeah. See, it's through the Word of God, as we listen to the Word of God, that we discover salvation. See, salvation that comes from this God that these seraphim are saying, these creatures are saying in Revelation chapter 4, holy, holy, holy. James says, put away all unholiness because you are going to allow this holy God to save you. Isn't that what happened to Isaiah? As that seraphim took this coal from the altar at the presence of God and touched his lip, and he says, your, your sins are you're forgiven? Your sins have been atoned for? See, it was the holiness of God that brought salvation to Isaiah. Folks, it's the holiness of God. It's a holy God that brings salvation to me and salvation to you. And how do we even know that? We know that through the Word of God. Holy. And these beings there in the throne room of heaven, they, they say these words, holy, holy, holy. 
They, they, they say they want the earth to be filled with the glory of God. See, can I tell you what the glory of God is? That word literally means a weight, a burden. See, when we come into the presence of God, we are burdened. We are weighted down by the holiness of God. That glory of God, see, that, that's what humbles us. And the glory of God comes about because of the holiness of God. See, see I, I am not worthy. I am not worthy to stand in the presence of God, and neither are you, and neither was Isaiah. I am assuming that Isaiah took the posture of an ancient Jew and he found himself on all fours with his head bowed down, saying, woe is me, woe is me. See, to stand in the presence of a holy God means a couple of things. This, whole, this word holy is a word that's foreign. Philip and I have been talking about that some in recent classes and lessons lately, but this concept of holiness is almost a foreign word to it. Oh, I, I know it's a church word, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, I, and I know it means, I, I, I know it means to be set, set apart, to be, to be separate, but here's what it means in my everyday common language. It means two things. It means to be different, and it means to be better. Folks, God is different than anything that you and I have ever seen, heard, or know about. God is better than anything that you and I have ever seen, heard, or know about. God is different and better. And it's through that difference and that better that we find salvation. We find salvation. And as we look at that story here in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, Isaiah is saying nothing other than woe is me, and he's saying that to himself. But then God immediately, immediately talks about the need for someone to go and tell others. Go and tell others What? about the holiness of God, about the weight of that holiness that turns into the glory of God. And, and here is Isaiah who says immediately, here am I, send me. See, he goes from one who is in the presence of God and saying nothing to being one who in the presence of God is now going to say everything. To say everything. See, when God invites us to speak, when He finally invites us to speak, you know what we need to do? We need to speak up. And what do we say? Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God... And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul speaking up about this holy God. Who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. In that spiritual realm that you and I can't see but we have been privileged to see through the word of God. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be what? holy and blameless before Him. He chose us to be holy. and He chose us to be like Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. One translation has that last phrase, because He wanted to. Why did God, why did this holy God want to save me and you unholy people? He just wanted to. Because that's what holiness is all about. He adopted us. There is no such thing as an unplanned adoption. 
God planned from before the foundation of the world. This holy God said, this is how I'm going to take this unholy people and I'm going to make them holy. I'm going to cleanse them and I'm going to make them be like, just like me. That's what God wants to make out of us. Holy beings. Uh, Tara, can we have the next slide? I hope it's the next slide. There it is. Anybody familiar with what that is? That's liquid gold. That's what I think it is when I have to purchase that at the store. I don't know about you. Can't believe it. Laundry detergent is that expensive. You know, we like our laundry detergents, and, and, and marketers have discovered that here's what we like about laundry detergent. We like for laundry detergent to make our whites whiter and our brights brighter. Right? I mean, I think every company has that as their ad. We'll make your whites whiter and your brights brighter. Do you know the first thing you do when you pull clothes out of the dryer? You what? You sm Wait a minute. You smell them? Wait a minute, but the advertisement and marketers, you know, they know this. We, we want our whites to be whiter and our brights to be brighter. And so when you pull them out, you go, <sighs> you know, I don't know that anybody holds them up to the light and say, yep, that's a brighter white. That's a whiter white and that's a brighter bright. Yeah, that's just what I was looking for. Can you believe research was done? about laundry detergent and people in their laundry detergents and how they react to their laundry detergents. And here's the conclusion. Real research, okay? Here's the conclusion. That feeling clean is more important than being clean. If it smells good, I like that. I don't really care if it's clean or not. You know, I, I have this gut feeling that the way we feel about our laundry detergents may be the way that we feel about our hearts and our souls. I'd rather feel like I'm clean rather than literally, really being clean. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. The writer says, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This chapter tells us about Christ's one-time sacrifice for all. When Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, and that's what happened to him, he paid the price for our sins. He, he paid the price so that you and I can be justified. And to be justified is to be able to stand before God, the God of judgment, and we stand there just as if I'd never sinned. You see, when I am justified in Jesus Christ, when I obey the gospel based upon, I did it when I was 15 years of age. I had believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. For I don't know how long I had believed that. I had tried to live a good life, do things God's way. And, and I was, as a teenager, maybe a little shame telling people that Jesus was the Christ, but as best maybe a 15-year-old would do, I would share that. I was immersed in water. Y'all know the date, don't you? It was December 25th, 1967. In that moment, I was justified. When I came up out of the waters of baptism, I was justified. Not 10%, not 30%, not 80%, but 100% justified. And sometimes I think, we think, that's all there is. What did James say? You put away all these unholy things and you receive the word that's able to save your souls. You see, justification is only part of the process. There's also sanctification. And sanctification has to do with our becoming holy. Justification is a point action. When we obey the gospel, we are as justified as we'll ever be. But sanctification keeps that intact and it keeps us even more in the process of what God intends for our lives 
of becoming like Him. Well, God, how do you do that? We want to know that, don't we? Well, here in Hebrews chapter 10, where we read that the single offering perfects us. He talks about those who are being sanctified. He goes on to say two verses down. At verse 15, he talks about the Holy Spirit. And he talks about that new covenant, verse number 16. This is the covenant I'm going to make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, quoting from Jeremiah, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Folks, justification forgives us of our past sins. Sanctification is an ongoing process of being forgiven of those current sins. And without sanctification, can I tell you, when you stand before the God of judgment, that gracious God may justify you, but I don't know about the rewards you're going to get. Now, I know I'm willing, to, I'm willing to admit that just being there would be fantastic. But why miss out on all that God intends for us? Justification and sanctification. That's what God wants with us, for us. And here's what it looks like. Here's a summation statement. Here's how God sums up justification and sanctification. And he tells us how to do both of those. Where? In his word. There's no guesswork. There's no, well, yeah, I think I'm clean. He tells us exactly how we're cleansed and how we are continually cleansed. And he says it like this. Real simple, short, sweet. Be holy, for I am holy. You be holy, because I am holy. Why is that so important? Why did Isaiah say in Isaiah 6, verse 5, Woe is me. You know what Isaiah knew? I have sin. Listen very carefully. In the presence of God, there is zero tolerance for sin. And who are we to come across and say, well, you know, zero tolerance. Go to the blood bank, roll up your sleeve, and they'll put the band around your arm, and they'll plug you in. And, and as they're plugging you in, you might say, listen, there's something I might need to tell you. I've got just a little bit of hepatitis. Not, not a whole lot. It's, it's not a lot. It's just a little bit. Or let's say you're an Olympic athlete, and they're doing the drug test. And right before they start to draw your blood, you tell them, look, I took just a, li just a few PEDs. That's performance-enhancing drugs. I mean, I am knowledgeable about that. Got just a little bit of steroids in me. Not, just a, not much, not much. Who am I to say? God, you, you know me. You know, I've got just, got just a little bit of sin. You know what John says about that in 1 John? Folks, we cannot be practicing sinners. We commit sin. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ that justifies me, because of the work of the Holy Spirit through His Word that tells me about this sanctification process that's attached to the, word, that's attached to the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the blood of Jesus Christ and the Word of God are intertwined. There's no separation. And because of that, because of that, I can have forgiveness of my sin, but I cannot, are you listening to me? I cannot be a practicing sinner, even if it's just a little bit. So what do we do? What do we do when we find ourselves in the presence of God? as his children. You see, if you're not a child of God, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one today because you are not justified. God will condemn you for eternity. 
So what are those of us who've done that? What, what, do, what do we do? I would say that we just say nothing. And that we listen to the Word of God. I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 1 through 20. I think I'm going to add 21 here too. Paul begins this passage by saying, Therefore be imitators of God or be followers of God. And then he talks about a whole lot of things that relate to being holy imitators of God. Imitate, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a, sacri a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity of covetousness must, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, covetous that is an idolater, has no, are you listening, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not associate with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part, no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you will walk, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I can't remember all that, can you? I can't remember it all. I need to spend more and more and more time in the Word of God. That's how God's Holy Spirit works in us. That's how God works through us. That's how God sanctifies us. More time in the Word. Can't I have a hard time remembering it all. But you know what I can remember? Three words. Holy, holy, holy. We're going to address one another with these three words here. Adam's going to come and lead us in a song that's so old. It's over 200 years old. It's almost as old as me. And we're going to sing those three words. And I want us to contemplate and think about the holiness of God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee.
the first words of that song is early in the morning. Early in the morning. What if we got up every morning and sang that song? Or maybe what if we just got up early in the morning? You see these seraphim and these creatures in the throne room of God, they were saying, holy, holy, holy. I think that would remind us of how different God is and how better God is. And I think it would remind me, and hopefully it would remind you, that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be better. And I think God knows what he's talking about. You know, sometimes, sometimes I feel like you may feel the same way. That our world is becoming unhinged. But can I tell you what's real? Let me give you a reality here. The holy king of kings is seated on his throne and he's ruling and will rule now and forever and ever and ever. If you're here this morning, you see, what we say is determined by who we say it to. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, If you're not a Christian and you're not justified before God, you need to say to God, woe is me. And you know what this holy God will do? When you obey the gospel, he will cleanse you. Maybe you're here this morning as a child of his. And you know that in the presence of God in the throne room of the Almighty King of Kings, that you would have to say, Woe is me. Why don't you say that to God this morning as you come in repentance? Whatever your need may be, a holy God is waiting to make you holy. And the opportunity is yours while we stand, while we sing. Hark the gentle voice of Jesus, Lord, tenderly upon your ear. Sweet is cry of love and pity, God, turn and listen and stay. Thank you.
go to God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful to have been here today. May we never take it for granted to assemble together with the saints to worship you in spirit and in truth, to sing songs of praise to your name. We're thankful for the word that was preached for Brother Jack today. We know your word is truth. We're so thankful for that. We're thankful for every member of the congregation and we pray for all that are sick and shut in, especially those in the Bolton, Sarah Montgomery, Sarah Womack, Bryce Holland, and many more, Father. We pray that you'd be be with the doctors and nurses that help them, Father. And we pray that they'll be able to come back soon and worship with us once again. We're very blessed to be a member of the body of Christ. So thankful for that. Thankful for, for Brother Kenny. We know he's a student of your word. But we realize that the devil can get into all of us' lives. We're so thankful for him and pray that you continue to bless him and forgive him. Be, this, be with us as we disassemble today. Be with us as we go to our respective homes. Forgive us of our sins and pray this in Christ's name. Amen.